I am saying it right here, this book was a two star. If you actually made them talk like grown adults, which they were, we're also going to ignore the fact that I am currently in a little bit of a slump. Hello book reading friends, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new, my name is Mel and today I bring you all the books that I read in August, also known as my August wrap up. I'm gonna be discussing all of the books that I read in the month of August, giving you small reviews for each of them and giving you a pretty detailed or so I think rundown of why I liked the book, why I disliked the book or why it was kind of in the middle and had both elements going into it. I can't quite remember the amount of books that I read in the month of August, I don't think it surpasses 12 books and that's for a number of reasons. A, I went into a slump for the second half of the month, and then I also read pretty lengthy books towards the beginning. I'm talking a number of books that I ended up reading in August were longer than 600 pages, so you better bet there were pretty lengthy books in here, but don't forget to let me know down below what you guys read throughout the month, if there were any particular favorites that you found, if there was anything that kind of caught your eye as you were reading, or anything that you think I particularly like. You can leave all of that down in the comments so we can have a nice discussion about all of the books that we read in the previous month. And before actually jumping into the video, I do need to introduce you guys to the sponsor of today's video, which is Likewise. I know, like me, this must happen to a lot of you where I either finish a book, or I finish a TV show, or I finish a movie, or I'm listening to a podcast and I ran out of episodes, and I don't know what to do with myself. So I kind of look everywhere on the internet for recommendations and for somebody or some place to tell me what I should be consuming next because I don't know where to look and who to trust when it comes to the these recommendations. Likewise is here to save your life. If you guys are not familiar with Likewise, they are the best platform to discover new recommendations for books, movies, TV shows, podcasts, and more. And the cool thing about Likewise is that it is powered by a combination of smart technology plus real recommendations from real people to get you out of that rut of not knowing what to do with yourself after you've done watching, reading, listening, or just consuming media in general. So you can trust that based on the things that you end up liking in this app, throughout your journey here and in your account, it will give you back the best personalized recommendations. That sounds kind of sexy. So if you do start using Likewise, there is a big possibility that you will never run out of things to read, watch, consume, everything in between, which is pretty cool if you ask me. As I was scrolling through Likewise and liking things and liking TV shows and movies and books and things that I have generally liked or disliked in the past, I did find this one movie that sounds super interesting and I'd actually never heard of it and it's called Called clickbait and we follow the family of the main character called Nick as his family gets abducted by this online crime organization and he goes in a race against time to try and save them and it seems exactly like the type of movie that I would love. I'm an action crime drama thriller junkie. So if you do want to check out Likewise I will be leaving my link at the top of the description so you can download the app. It is completely free which is phenomenal and you can also follow me on the app. I will be leaving my handle here on the screen so you can go follow me, we can be friends over on Likewise. So yes, thank you so much to Likewise for sponsoring this video. I hope that you guys check them out because they made this video possible. And without a further ado, let's get right into all the books that I read in the month of August. That month that put me into a slam. Okay, so I just came to the interesting realization that I only read nine books in the month of August, but I am not mad at this number. I think it's a really realistic number. And also, I will say that reading slump was a godsend. And I know that sounds super weird because for the most part, people are really angry at reading slumps. Nobody wants to be in one. And while I do understand that a lot because sometimes it can be quite tedious, I like the amount of time that it gave me to just relax and focus on planning for September and filming and editing and just focusing my energy on other areas areas that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So although I did go into a slump, I'd say I went into a slump because I read a pretty freaking amazing book, like one of my favorite books of all time now. And the first book that I read in August was The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Now you guys know I was meant to read this book in July. Didn't get around to it because obviously it's a really big book. It's like 800 pages. So it was the first book that I read in August and there are absolutely no regrets on this. I think I read this book in less than two days, I believe. You guys, it's very rare that I stay up reading a book, but with this one, I did. And I think with this one, it's best to enter it with the most vague synopsis ever, which is exactly what the back says. And it is a world divided, a queendom without an heir, an ancient enemy awakens. I think it's pretty perfect. I definitely think this book would have been better off being a duology. I don't think it should have expanded any further than that, but I really do think it would have benefited from being split into two different parts because there is so much 
much going on in this book. There's so much that needs to be established, again, given the fact that it is a single standalone fantasy. And that being said, a lot of things were not explained as in detail as I would have preferred, especially when it comes to the dragons. I think the dragon lore in this one was pretty loose, and sometimes a lot of the explanations for the world building felt a little bit cop outy to me, and it didn't feel like they had a lot of depth to them. It just felt like it's supposed to be deep, and you're supposed to embrace this and just move on with it, and accept the fact that they all come from some sort of magical fairy dust that fell from the sky and a meteor. And I'm sure half the people wouldn't mind it being that explanation, but I personally wanted a little bit more. I also think that because there's a dragon on the cover, and of course the dragons are part of the main synopsis if you do go to Goodreads, I expected a little bit more dragons from this. I genuinely think they had so much potential and it ended up falling a little bit flat for me on that end. But I will say what I did love about this was obviously Iyad and Sabran. I absolutely love the two of them and their dynamic and their relationship and how it slowly but surely evolved throughout the entirety of the book. It is a sapphic romance, which was executed beautifully in my opinion. I think their romance was very heartfelt but very heartbreaking. I think both characters are very frustrating at times because they are so set in their ways and they both have very different motivations and ideals and morals moving into life. And so to see them kind of leave a lot of prejudices behind and to leave a lot of duty behind to come together or try to at the very least was incredibly interesting and fascinating and engaging. I genuinely adored every single step of their relationship and how it evolved. And I think Sabran as a character is a character that has a lot of layers given how she was raised. She was raised in this household that was very authoritarian. It kind of reminds me, I think the best way that I could explain this was if the Baratheons from Game of Thrones were in this setting, it would be Sabran's family. A family that constantly kind of wants to push their ideals onto the people and they don't want to accept that life and the world and the universe could far surpass what they know. And it was again really fascinating to see Sabran kind of shed all of those layers to her and to kind of come to terms with all of these things and embrace the fact that she is not the end all be all and her family is not the end all be all. So I thoroughly enjoyed that and I think the action scenes in this book were also really great. Up until we got to the last hundred pages or so, we were doing so incredibly well and then it felt like I'd read a 780 page book to get a 20 page wrap up. Right now as I talk about this book, I am leaning towards a four star even though it was so all over the place at times and there were a lot of loose ends that I wish were tied. But when I look past those details and I look at enjoyment as a whole, I really had a great time reading this book. The second book I read in August is a book that I really wish I had annotated at the time of reading it and that is From Luca With Love by Mariana Zapata. This book took me extremely by surprise. I really wanted to go into Mariana Zapata's sports romances. I had heard incredible things in the past. I had heard that they were really, really slow burn, but that they were beautiful stories and every page was worth it. And oh boy, did the people not lie, at least with this one. This one was really, really good. And in this one, we have like a cutting edge situation. You know that movie where we have athletes who particularly do ice skating and then one of the partners is injured, so they have to look for another person to fulfill that spot, but they really hate each other or they have some sort of misunderstanding where they think that they hate each other. And then at the end of the movie, they come together and they love each other and they get married and have babies. Maybe not the latter. That is exactly what this book was. And I ate it up. I found myself relating a lot to Jasmine as a main character. She is naturally an overthinker and she struggles a lot with her feelings, particularly with her job and how she has focused all of her energy into ice skating, that she has given up time with friends and family and just have kind of downtime for herself to rest. She has given up a lot of things in order to make it in this industry. And because it constantly goes up and down and she really hasn't made it in the way that she was expecting or in the way that she really wanted, she feels like she's doing all this for nothing. And I really related to that in a lot of different areas of my life. I think it was a really heartfelt, beautiful moment. I started bawling my eyes out and just seeing her relationship with her mom as well was really beautiful. It was really beautiful to kind of see that dynamic and to see such a tight-knit family in general. It really reminded me of my family and it was just a really beautiful story in terms of her own arc separately from the romance. And then you have Ivan Lukov who is obviously the love interest and he was like a big teddy bear. He was one of those characters that definitely kind of came down to the miscommunication trope of them not knowing exactly why they hated each other or why exactly they were so at each other's throats. But I think it was executed in a way where it didn't feel like miscommunication but it rather felt like two individuals who didn't think they could come together and work both as part partners and in a relationship and long term as they started to know each other better and they explored the dynamics of their relationship they realized how wrong they were so I really do think that it was a beautiful book a beautiful story and definitely one that I'd reread in the future. Forgot to mention
watched it from Look of Love, definitely five stars, though by all the gushing that I did, because there's, in my opinion, nothing wrong with that book. And then because I was still in the mood for romance and I didn't know what to read, I of course went back to the queen herself, Mariana Zapata, and I downloaded The Wall of Winnipeg and Me, which I didn't end up liking as much as I enjoyed from Look of Love, which was unfortunate because I know that's kind of like the fan favorite, but I personally, while I did love a lot of things that it did, I didn't vibe with it as much as this one. I ended up reading The Wall of Winnipeg and Me a three out of five stars. Wasn't anything special. I didn't connect to the characters on the level that I did with the other ones. And so that also kind of hindered my experience. I think maybe if I would have read these books more spaced out, my opinion would be different. Now in this one, we have a fake dating trope, which I definitely did not expect. We have the Wall of Winnipeg himself, who is a football player, and he is not American. I believe he is Canadian. And so he is on the US on a work visa. And he has his assistant that he takes for granted literally every single day. He is a major asshole to her. And so he constantly takes her for granted, except when he needs something. And he comes around and he's like, yo, let's just fake marry so that I can get a permanent visa or a residency or citizenship or whatever it is he wanted to get. And let's fake it out and I'll pay you and I'll pay off your debts and I'll do this and I'll do that. But I was really frustrated with the way that these two came together and the reasonings why. So it really was, again, all over the place for me because when I look at the very beginning of the book, I was just, I was just fed up. I just wanted it to be over. Three stars is where we've landed. A book that is no longer on my shelves because it has been unhauled. And I think that should tell you just about how this book went. And that is Starfish by Akemi Down Bowman. This is another book that I really thought I would love. It screamed everything that Mel would adore in a coming of age story. We follow our main character, Kiko, who is half Japanese and her mom is constantly giving her a hard time with everything in her life, quite literally, but most particularly about her Japanese side of the family. And it makes her feel very inadequate, not only in what she wants to pursue, which is the arts, and in her heritage and identity itself. And she thinks that the one way she can escape that is by getting accepted to her dream college, except then she gets rejected and she really doesn't know what path to take. She feels very discouraged. And so here's where the synopsis itself gets tricky, because the synopsis says that a childhood friend comes in and offers to take her on this magical trip where they can explore universities. That's just not how it happens. This girl literally runs away from home, hops on a car with him to go back to his place in California, stay there for weeks on end with the irresponsible parent on the other side not doing anything about it but whining. That's kind of where the synopsis gets a little bit tricky. So she does leave and she thinks that exploring this new side of the world will give her some answers that she is seeking in terms of identity, in terms of college in terms of a lot of different things and motivation, etc. And while a lot of things do pan out at the very end of the book, I was really frustrated reading this book. I think this book, Saving Grace, was absolutely the writing. The writing for this was literally stunning. It was phenomenal. I think this book would have benefited a lot from being written in verse instead of prose, but who am I to judge? Because it felt very underdeveloped. A lot of things didn't seemingly have an explanation. A lot of trigger warnings in this book that I also was not aware of. Everybody recommends this book and goes, it's such a beautiful story and it's heartbreaking, but they never say what trigger warnings are in the story. And so when I stumbled upon all of them, I definitely was not expecting child trauma, parental abuse, particularly emotionally, body shaming, a suicide attempt, child molestation as well. It was really tough to read in such an underdeveloped way. It felt like a lot of details had been glossed over for the sake of it being plot devices. And if there's one thing that I don't agree with, it's any any of those things. If you're gonna talk about such serious issues, situations, instances, you better make it an in-depth conversation about why these things are taking place in the story, how it has affected the character, and how the character is gonna move forward from that particular event. And the reality is a lot of those things didn't happen because the book was so condensed, it was so short, that it didn't really have the space to do that. Or if it did, it was wasted in other unimportant things. And again, this is very much my opinion. I know a lot of people disagree. I know a lot of people adore this book. I personally, unfortunately, I'm not one of those people. I just think that everything was handed to the main character. Literally everything came to her so easily from college to experience to contacts. Things like those just don't drop out of the sky like it seemingly did for her. I feel like I'm saying that word a lot, seemingly. I don't know where that's coming from, but it felt like everything was just being handed to her for the sake of, again, plot progression. I am saying it right here. This book was a 
to start. And so the next book that I read was The Chase by Elle Kennedy. Now this is kind of a disappointing book for me. I genuinely thought I was gonna carry out with the rest of the series and unfortunately I am not. This is a book that at first I was really vibing with and then the more that I think about this book, the angrier I get. This ended up being a three star for me though it could potentially be a two star in the future as I get angrier about it. But in this one we have the trope of opposite to trash. And we have Fitzy and then we have Summer De Laurentiis who is Dean's sister and this is a character that is originally introduced in the off-campus series and I thought the Briar U series was the same thing though it is not so I went into this book really thinking that it was the first one in the off-campus. It was a whole thing. However, both of these characters have their first meetup in the off-campus series so we don't see that in the text in this book. So we kind of enter this book with them already knowing each other, already having this indifferent sort of relationship and Summer being very set on her ways and being very, very ambitious in her ways of getting Fitzy. She is very much intent on getting him. That is not something that he seemingly wants. I was really frustrated with this book because a lot of this book came down to miscommunication of her thinking that he said something that he truly didn't mean and Kim thinking that she hates him because of whatever he thought, which wasn't really true. And it was really frustrating to see them go in circles around each other. I just really wanted it to be over at one point. The chemistry was there. The tension was there. I just think that a lot of things would have been developed better if we kind of shed all of these elements of the book hat that were really unnecessary. There was a love choo-choo train in this one. I don't like calling them love triangles anymore because that's not what they are. But I definitely was very frustrated with this one because it felt like a plot device to drive these characters apart when they really should have been working on being together all along. I really hated the way that Summer continuously strung along the other guy to kind of forget about this other guy that she was so intent on getting. It was just so morally wrong and it was so manipulative towards the other guy that I really hate the fact that he ended up being hurt because it was so unnecessary for him. Though I will say what I did like about Summer's personality is the fact that she is what literature tried to shed for so long and that's why the stereotype for like the not like other girls trope was invented. So I like the fact that she doesn't fit in that mold but she is very much a girly girl and she is rich and blonde and blue-eyed. But again it was very much like opposites attract like he's supposed to be this nerdy guy who's into gaming and she is again the blonde blue-eyed rich girl who loves to party but who is kind of deep on the inside without you noticing. So I really just felt whatever towards the book. Like I don't think it really accomplished anything significant. Was it a fun read at the time? Sure. But there was just a lot of things that were weird with this one. The guy that Fitzy was interviewing with for that one job, if you've read the book you know, he was so odd as a character and again it felt like a plot device to just keep these characters further apart than they should have been. So I just think this book could have literally been 100 pages easily if you actually made them talk like grown adults, which they were. Then I obviously got around to my Patreon book club pick for the month of August, which was The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. Now this is a book that in hindsight, I really do think I enjoyed this more than I initially thought. What I have to remind myself going into a genre like this, which is slasher horror, is the fact that a lot of things will be insensitive. The genre is not made to be sensitive. A lot of things are said that are horrible, a lot of things are done that are horrible, and we just kind of have to embrace that as a consumer of this particular genre, whether that's in visual form or in book format. It really doesn't matter. A lot of those tropes are very overlapping. So this one is pretty much self-explanatory, I think. We follow a final girl support group, which is essentially a group of women who have gone through very traumatic events in the past, slasher moments, quite literally, where they've been the last girl standing, and so they decide to all come together in this group and kind of give each other the lending hand that the other needs. And we follow particularly Lynette, who is our main character, who is very much an unreliable narrator. And if there's one thing about this book that I really did enjoy was that Lynette's POV was filled with anxiety and tension and trauma and PTSD, and all of that was written to a T. It was so expertly written, it was really uncomfortable at times to read because as I was reading this book, I personally felt my anxiety spike and I constantly had to put this book up and down and kind of figure out in what time slots I was reading in because it made me feel so anxious and an edge myself. And again, that is all due to Lynette and how she handles her life and she is a very methodical person. She has very much made a routine-like lifestyle for herself so that she feels the safest that she possibly can, either when she's at home or when she goes out. Her lifestyle really reminds me of Lori from Halloween, the 2018 sequel. Kind of when you see the aftermath of that event that happened to her when she was younger. That is definitely what this is because all of the characters are either in their 
their mid 30s or early 40s so they've kind of already gone through a good chunk of life having dealt with that so it was really interesting to see that sort of side represented in a book however as the book carries on there is a person who is targeting these final girls and wants to eliminate all of them once and for all and I will say the majority of this book was really enjoyable it was a really fantastic read I found a lot of insensitive comments towards alcoholism and drug addiction that I really did not love as I was reading this and I was genuinely really pissed at the way that the conversations were being handled because a lot of people were being blamed for things that were mostly out of their control and so again I kind of need to separate myself from that and remind myself that the genre does that a lot and while I did enjoy most of this book the downfall of it was the last third a lot of things ended up happening without any real foreshadowing or red herrings so a lot of it ended up feeling like a bootleg version of Scream 4 which I really didn't love I think the last third is truly what brought this book down for me if that last third would have been carried better I generally would have rated this book either a four or a five star I also didn't realize how out of tune I was with the slasher subgenre of horror because there were a lot of slasher films references that I am seeing now because the people are pointing them out or just a lot of references within those movies that I personally didn't catch because I wasn't familiar with any of them so a lot of those references really did fly over my head because I had no idea what was happening or what was being addressed but I really liked the conversations established in here about the horror genre in itself and the glorification of true crime and slashers and horror itself there was a lot of great commentary towards the genre what has been done in the past and how that reflects into real life I think that was done really well in this book so all in all it ended up being a three star for me but I generally think it can wiggle itself between a three and a four at any given moment we are finally stepping into five star book territory and that is The Last Wish which is the first novella in the Witcher series I did read this for my Henry Cowell video but I won't go too in depth about this one in this video because I talked about both of those books for ages so I'll just leave that link down below you can refer back to that and watch it it's literally an hour-long video go have fun there's just so much content in there about both books that I don't feel like I need to talk too much about these in the Witcher series we follow Geralt of Rivia who is a witcher and they are assassins for hire and they essentially kill off demons and monsters and every supernatural creature you could potentially think of and we follow him through a collection of short stories that all tie up at the end and I am sure they will continue to come back in later installments so that is really fun what I didn't really expect going into this was that each short story was going to be inspired on classic fairy tales we have Rumpled Stillskin and Snow White and Cinderella Beauty and the Beast there was just a bunch of fun ones in here the writing was gorgeous in this book too there were moments where it felt very lyrical or poetic and it was a genuine surprise that I got from this book because I didn't think I was going to love it as much as I did I didn't know how similar yet different it was from the show I never finished season one but I did love what I watched obviously without the context of what was happening here Geralt as a main character is incredibly compelling and although the world as a whole is not incredibly intricate in terms of magic systems I think the excitement and action scenes and the complex characters that we have in this one compensate for that and I think that's what generally makes the story so exciting is the fact that we don't have to spend a lot of time world building because we can do that as we go in the different short stories as Geralt encounters different situations but rather we can work a lot on that character development that character exposition but it was generally a beautiful story loved every second of it and it had me hooked I read this in a day it was honestly a great one and the book that put me into a slump is The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson hello the other book that I read in the Henry Cavill video so again if you want to hear all of my in-depth thoughts about this you can go refer to that video and I'm sure you'll find anything or hopefully everything that you need to to convince you to either read this or not it's completely up to you I will set the book down because it is a weapon and it's heavy Brandon Sanderson has this astonishing gift of writing intricate stories that even in its dullest moments are exciting I am honestly so in awe of his writing style and the ambition that he continuously sets out with into every single one of his stories, or at least the ones that I've read so far. It is so insane that this book is this long and yet I felt bored at no single point of this book. It is also insane that it is this long but it was that easy to understand. I think truly one of the only intimidating things about this book is the length but once you actually get into the content of the book it's really easy to read and it genuinely flies by. The audiobook is also fan-freaking-tastic for this one and we in Way of Kings are established in this world called Roshar where there is an ongoing war in the Shattered Plains 
Remains, which is a collection of Casims, and we have a variety of characters as part of our main cast, particularly Kaladin, who is a Britsman, and he and his team basically carry bridges through the Casims to connect them all and allow the army to pass through and keep going through the war. Then we have Dalinar, who is a part of the royal family, and he is obsessed with this ancient text called the Way of Kings that is seemingly connected to the war that is going at the moment. And then we have Shallan, who is currently studying to be a scholar. There is literally so much happening, so many moving elements to this one. It's obviously a very ambitious story because it is high epic fantasy. I, again, loved every single second of it. I think Sanderson truly has this gift of building such intricate, expansive worlds and then having it all be connected in some way, shape, or form. The action scenes were incredibly detailed in a way that, again, they were easy to digest, but they were still very exciting and stressful. The mental health rep on this one is phenomenal with Kaladin. And all of the characters are so three-dimensional, which is a thing that I encounter with Sanderson over and over again. There is just not a single motif to these characters. There are so many layers to them. And although it might not seem that way when you start, as you start reading, they start shedding their different layers. And you start to know them on a more personal basis, which is really nice. So you truly kind of do know these characters through and through, and you'll continue to meet them as the books go on, or hopefully so. So as the start of a series for the Stormlight Archive, it truly was a fantastic journey for me. I loved every second of it. I'm sure I'm forgetting a million other things that I could have mentioned, but if you do want to know more, there is that video where I talk about it very, very in depth. Also a five star if you wouldn't have guessed. And then last but not least, this is a graphic novel that I read in the hopes of getting out of the slump that I had been in after Way of Kings. I didn't get out of a slump, I'm still kind of struggling, but it's fine, and that is The Girl from the Sea. It is a sapphic graphic novel, and it was so freaking cute. It was also a super quick read. There wasn't as much text, I guess, as some graphic novels have, but the illustration style for this one was truly just stunning. It was a beautiful story, and it was very much about our main character, Morgan, embracing her sexuality and finding a space for herself and exploring love without any sort of boundaries and just exploring life in general through a different lens that she hasn't done in the past. And it was, again, a really beautiful story. It is kind of magical realism fantasy in a way because the love interest is a siren, but it, I just really can't say anything else besides it was cute. It's like, it was, it's really hard to talk about this one because it's so short without really spoiling anything. It was a four out of five stars for me, so it was definitely kind of the little pick-me-up that I needed after Way of Kings. And so those are all the books that I read in the month of August. Again, a significantly smaller amount than I have read in the past, and I am a-okay with it. As you can see, it was a very meh month. Again, moving forward, I do want to try and read less books, but hopefully more quality books, as the old saying goes. Quality over quantity. We shall see how that ends up going for me. But definitely let me know down in the comments what you ended up reading in the month of August. If there was any particularly great books, any new favorites, anything that you'd like to pass on the recommendation for. Let me know all of that down in the comments. If you reached the end of the video, let's leave some sword emojis down below for Way of Kings and for The Last Wish. I know I've used that emoji before, but it doesn't really matter. So let's leave some sword emojis down below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and you can subscribe down below if you haven't already. I am constantly uploading videos here on the channel. And if you want to support the channel further, I do have a Patreon. We call ourselves The Citadel and there is a bunch of exciting stuff happening over there as well. So you can check that down below in the link as well as all of my social medias in case you want to support me further. You guys know where to find me. Again, thank you so much to Lifewise for sponsoring this video. Don't forget that you can also download their app and follow me on there. The link is at the top of my description. It's completely free and that way you can get even more book recommendations either that I can give you as well on the app or that other people can help you as well. Thank you so much to them once more for sponsoring this video. I love you guys so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys!